Hello, and welcome to show number 2328 of Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. Lookout is definitely one app that I end up using um, at least a couple of times a week, minimally. It has different modes. So, for example, it has text mode, document mode, explore mode, currency recognition mode, and image mode. And that is just one of the new features that Google has introduced that we'll be talking about in this show. We'll be speaking with Jotsna Kaki, a blind accessibility analyst at Google, about a number of the latest features in G Suite and Android designed to enhance the experience for visually impaired users. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip comes from Jotsna Kaki. Do you have a tip of the week for us? I would say something that my parents have always told me. Try try again. Never give up. The harder you try, the better results you will get. Never presume and keep on trying. And what great advice that is. It reminds me of something that one of our children's teachers told them in grade school, and it was, never say you can't, always say you'll try. And, you know, if you don't try, you'll never know if you can succeed. You may fail once in a while, but Failure means learning, too. And that applies across all facets of life, whether it's your job or a hobby or anything you want to accomplish. Never give up. And next week, we'll be hearing more of Jotsna's story about how that attitude has really paid off for her. You are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Let's start by meeting Jotsna and learning about Google's accessibility team. Today we have a representative from Google who's going to tell us a little bit about what's new in accessibility. So I was hoping you could introduce yourself and tell a little bit about what you do at Google. Sure. Um, my name is Jotsna Kaki. My role currently at Google is an accessibility analyst. Primarily, I'm part of the central accessibility team, and my main focus is on accessibility testing. I do a range of responsibilities where I do some accessibility testing. I also am a Google manager um, for the central accessibility testing team. I work with other individuals to provide training about accessibility and a bunch of other projects, as I can think of. Yeah. So Google's idea of accessibility covers a wide range of disabilities. Do you have a disability yourself? Yes, I am completely blind and I have been uh, since 2004. So you've been using Access Tech for a while. Yes. Personally, I've been mostly using screen readers on mobile as well as on web. Um, but I also use Braille displays uh, primarily for giving demos and as well as for doing some testing. How long have you been at Google? I've been at Google for a bit over 16 years. Wow. And how did you get into your current position from your original position? I actually lost my vision when I was in my final year of undergrad. And when I lost my vision, I was like, okay, what would I do after graduating? As I was trying to figure it out, I ran across accessibility issues with websites and I got really interested in accessibility. But back then, most of the private companies did not have an accessibility role. So I thought, well, that's out of the question. But my dad said, wait, you know, why don't you try to make up a resume for the role you think is what you want to go for? Try. If you don't get it, you don't get it. And back then, there wasn't um, anyone really like an accessibility team at Google. 
but one thing led to the other. And believe it or not, they created a position to get me into Google. And they created the exact position I had put on my resume. And they had hired me for it. And that's where the journey all started. And how big is the accessibility team at Google now? I cannot really cap a number to that because we have a specific accessibility team, which is a centralized team, but we also have accessibility within pretty much majority of the product team. So accessibility is spread. It's not only the central team that exists. So I would say quite huge. So my kind of understanding is that Google has this centralized accessibility team, but there are lots and lots of projects going on at Google. And so each of those projects has to have some link into accessibility and perhaps has their own individuals that deal with accessibility for their specific product. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Underwriting pairs the impact of targeted marketing with the integrity of community goodwill. Learn more by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is some of the latest G Suite and Android operating system features that can enhance the experience for visually impaired users. Well, as you mentioned in the introduction, you are visually impaired, and that's exactly what our listeners are interested in learning more about today in terms of what new things they can look for in terms of Google products, such as your Android phones and Google Docs, et cetera. So where would you like to start? There are definitely a lot of improvements um, that have been made across Google products. But we can start with, let's say, the G Suite projects, such as Docs, um, Drive, and other major products that are primarily, I would say, more widely used. So, for example, if we talk about calendar, right, something that pops up because something we use on a regular basis. So just to highlight a few uh, main things. So in calendar, for example, they have added a few new features, such as keyboard shortcuts meaning for when you have a calendar invite open, they have added keyboard shortcuts for the user to simply press a keyboard shortcut to read the title, the date, the time, guests, so on and so forth. So you can just press a shortcut. You don't have to navigate through the whole page to get that information. Just makes interaction, I would say, much more seamless and easy. That's a good thing, because particularly calendars can be a real mess for a blind person to look at when they only see a limited portion of the screen or hear a limited portion of the screen. Exactly. Yes. It just makes it, uh, you know, much easier and faster. Um, then we also have uh, improvements in like Docs, Drive, Slides, so on and so forth. So one of the key things is, as you may be aware, Docs, Drive, the all of them have an accessibility menu. So where you can select and set certain preferences. So for example, do you want Braille enabled? Do you want Braille support? So like in, for example, in Google Sheets, do you want the column header to be read? So on and so forth. So previously, when you applied a, an accessibility setting, it was applied across all the products such as docs, um, sheets, so on and so forth. However, now you can individually set it. So when you put a setting in, let's say, for example, docs, it won't be applied across. You can individually set it. So it just makes it better because the customization, you might want something different in each one. Also in slides, there's an HTML present mode. And now they have made improvements to it because there were specific um, issues for screen users with it. So now they have made improvements in there to give a better experience for screen data users. So if you want to view this, uh, the HTML present, you can simply add a slash HTML present to the end of the URL of the slide that you want to view in that mode and your experience will be much better. Oh, that's great. The ability to customize 
how you use it for each application is really great because we do use these applications differently from each other. Definitely. So I am not personally familiar with Google Docs and Google Sheets. And I'm wondering, how do people change these settings? Because these are all web interfaces. Yes. So in order to change the settings, so you would go to, for example, the Docs or the Sheets toolbar, and you have an accessibility menu there itself. So when you go in the accessibility menu, you have various options you can select in there. Similarly, also under the tools menu, you have an accessibility option. When you enable that, you get a pop-up. There are also a few um, options in there that you can select. So that sounds pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Very easy, very simple. So just like you would go to the file menu, edit menu, you just go to the accessibility menu, or you would go to the tools menu and you pull up the accessibility option in there. And now Google has their own screen reader that you can use with their applications. That's called Vox, I believe? It's called Chromevox. Chromevox. Yes. And that is built into the Chrome OS. So if you have a Chromebook, you can go ahead and enable Chromevox by pressing Control-Alt-Z, Z as in Zebra, and Chromevox will be enabled. The first time you enable the screen reader, you will get a pop tutorial that you can go through. It's very easy to use. Um, in fact, I'm using Chromebox and that's my primary machine for work. And it's definitely, I would say, I mean, I know I'm well-versed using VoiceOver, JAWS, NVDA, and some other screen readers, but I've found Chromebox to be really easy to adapt to. So you said that this tutorial pops up the first time you open Chromevox. What if you need a reminder of how to do something on your second or 200th time using it? Sure. I mean, there are multiple ways you can get to the tutorial. You can always Google it for a Chromevox tutorial. But uh, I believe uh, I would have to double check, but... You can also go into the launcher menu on the Chromebook, and you do have accessibility option. So when you go in there, you have an option under Chromebox to launch the tutorial. And I suppose if someone with a Windows or Mac PC wanted to test this out, they could use the Chrome browser to enable the Chromevox screen reader? So the Chromebox extension on other OS has been deprecated. So it used to be the case you could uh, download the extension and use it that way, but that extension has been deprecated. Ah, okay. Because I remember playing with that a few years ago, but since I was using JAWS for so many years, I hadn't played around with it a whole lot. Yeah. So primarily right now, yeah, on the Chrome OS, on the Chromebook, you could just use uh, Chromebooks. So we went through Google Docs and Google Sheets, and you talked a little bit about Google Drive. Mm-hmm. What changes can people expect to see there? So in Google Drive, definitely, I mean, it, it is accessible. I wouldn't say there's specific uh, updates or changes uh, as a thing, but it's overall a portal for docs, sheets, everything. So that's what Drive is. And it definitely does work great um, with screen readers. I've actually started using that to share information with our grandkids. I've been writing little songs for them, and it's a great way to share things, particularly because our son has an Android phone. So, mm. And speaking of Android, you want to talk a little bit about new accessibility features in Android that people might not be familiar with? Sure. So for Android, there is a website we have. It's android.com slash accessibility. You can always stay up to date and look for other useful information there. There are specific, so with TalkBack, there is um, more support for Braille, for grade one Braille as well. And there's this feature called guided selfie capture. So basically what you can do now is you can Take a selfie of yourself as a blind person. What happens is when you open it and you do the front camera, as you hold the phone in front of you, it will give you the guidance. It will say, for example, good for selfie as you move the phone around. 
once it says good for selfie, if you hold the phone in the same position, you will get a countdown three, two, one, and it will automatically take a picture. Well, I know some sighted people who could make good use of that assistance. Oh, most definitely. That is a great feature because being blind, you never quite know where you're pointing the camera, and it's good to have that kind of assistance. Definitely. Yeah, this selfie feature, I have definitely used it myself where I've needed to capture a picture. And even in the camera, you have this feature. When you're taking a picture of someone, it will tell you the information, like, for example, it will say top 20% of the screen or left 20% of the screen. Of course, it doesn't tell you 100%, like, it's not as useful as is telling you if, if it's good for selfie or not. However, I personally have been able to take good pictures from that guidance as well. And, you know, it's very useful, um, especially as a blind person, not knowing. And it's not always true that you don't have to take pictures. You know, many times I end up taking pictures for different purposes. And both of these features has been really amazing. And now you also have another feature, which I think is really neat on the Android systems, is this app, I think it's called Lookout, that will describe what the camera is seeing. And that feature can be very useful to a blind person. Oh, most definitely. Lookout is definitely one app that I end up using um, at least a couple of times a week, minimally. So Lookout has different modes. So for example, it has text mode, documents mode, explore mode, currency recognition mode, and image mode. So the image mode is where, let's say, for example, whether it's a photo of someone or it's an image that uh, we, I have, I can go ahead and download it. And if I open it in this app, then it will give me a description. So one example I can give you is recently I pulled up a photo in there. And if I'm saying, for example, a young aged female um, sitting down, so on and so forth. And I tried it with a couple of photos. And just based on the snippet image description it gave me, I was able to remember what that photo was. And it also has a feature where I can ask a question and I can say, for example, uh, what is the background like? Uh, what is a person doing or something of that sort? And it will give an answer. So you can query some extra things about the image after the app told you overall what the image was about. Yes, exactly. That's great. What other modes did you want to tell us about? So there's also the document mode or the text mode, which in addition to just doing printed text, it also does a handwriting detection. So even for papers with handwriting on it, you can use this mode to read that text. It is amazing how far these tools have come along these days. Most definitely. Most definitely. And definitely also for currency and uh, you have different other country currency, which has been added. Um, similarly, food labels, like they keep on adding more and more uh, products to the database so that it can identify a greater number of products over time. So it can tell the difference between a banana and an apple, but I assume it can also read the label on a can? The food label mode in itself doesn't identify like a banana or an apple. It actually reads the labels. So it takes the label on the product and then it will identify it to you. So it's, whether it's a packet or a can or a bottle of soda or something of that sort. So when you take it, it will give you guidance. So it might say product not recognized, rotate to the other side of that sort. But once it recognizes it, it will tell you what that product is. Great. People also talk about Braille support and how that's improved over the years on Android devices. Can you talk a little bit about Braille support? So previously, a long time ago, on Android, you had to specifically go through certain settings and enable it in Braille back and, you know, separately. But now in TalkBack, it's well integrated. And over time, they keep on increasing the number of devices which are supported on Android, and definitely 
you know, more seamless type of an experience because you can just plug it in and start using it. You don't have to go in and do all of the various changes and settings and everything. I understand Google has implemented a handy way to control the volume of TalkBack. Can you talk about that? One other very useful feature that has been added on Android is for changing the volume control for TalkBack. So previously, you could go to settings or you had to kind of, while TalkBack was talking, you could press the up and down arrow keys for volume to change the volume. But now all you need to do is put a finger on the screen. And then if you press volume up and down buttons, that will adjust the volume of TalkBack. So that just makes it much easier. Oh, that's nice. That sounds pretty simple. So you don't have to go swiping around to find the particular setting for volume. Exactly. And I think Android also makes it easy to independently change the volume of audio versus TalkBack versus other applications, right? Yes. So you do have it in settings where you can go in and do that, where separately you change the volume. But you also have the option to make it easier for TalkBack users. You can go in the settings and select that, for example, when TalkBack is talking, to lower the volume of any other audio that's playing on the phone. So that makes it definitely easy for blind users because oftentimes you end up in this conundrum that say a video is playing or something, you won't be able to hear talk back over that audio. So in this scenario, it just makes it much more easier where that volume will be lowered automatically when talk back is talking. Yeah, been there. That can be difficult as a blind person to change that volume when there's something else making a lot of noise. So if we missed anything, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? So one thing I do want to mention, so in December 2022, they launched an accessibility discovery center in London office. And that's the first one outside of US that has been launched. And it's a great place for people to learn, research, and develop about accessibility technology. It's been very, very widely visited, a super popular place and really great place is what I've heard. So it sounds like this is being used both as a development center and also a training center. Yes. And also, you know, both for one thing to do is to encourage within, you know, the company people to come and learn about what is assistive technology, what are various disabilities, all of that as well. But that center specifically is also open for non-employees. Well, that is a wonderful idea because unless people experience some of these things and see how people who are differently abled work with the tools that they use every day, they really can't appreciate the issues that you run into and why some of these applications and programs need to be made accessible. That is very true. I mean, from my personal experience, that's always the case. Many times, individuals without the disabilities, they don't understand the importance or the pain point. The first time you sit them down and say, okay, here's, let's say, for example, a screen reader. Why don't you try using your product with a screen reader? It just makes me start laughing when they start using it and they're struggling with it. And then they really understand, you know, what it means to use products which are inaccessible. The other related issue is I think that programs and applications that are made to be more accessible for people who are differently abled are often more easily usable and more pleasurable to use by most of the rest of the population. You're 100% correct about that. In fact, many times it happens that when I have performed accessibility testing of products and we send the issues to a product team, they come back and say, hey, we asked you to do accessibility testing, not usability testing. You know, you found all usability issues. I'm like, well, yeah. You know, majority of the time, accessibility issues are just more so usability issues. And if you make your product accessible, it's going to be much more user friendly for anyone, even without a disability. Good point. You are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Now for this week's final item, 
how to learn more about accessibility across all of Google's products, and how to contact Jotz Nakaki. Well, if people want to learn more about how to use some of these products accessibly that we've talked about, maybe you can remind people about some of the resources that we've talked about and where they can find them. Sure. So you can always Google it. That's the best place because we have our accessibility website specific to Android. You have android.com slash accessibility. One more great feature is many of the Google products, they have to pull up a list of keyboard shortcuts that a specific product has, you can just press control slash, meaning the question mark, that button. If you press that keyboard shortcut, you will get a pop-up which will have various keyboard shortcuts which have been implemented into that product. Simple, easy way, just pull it up and go through it. If somebody had a question for you, is there a way they can reach you? Sure. I can tell you my email address. So it's J as in Jackie, K as in kangaroo, A as in apple, K as in kangaroo, I as in igloo at google.com. So that's jkaki at google.com. And as usual, if you missed any of the contact information, you can find it in the show notes associated with this episode, which is episode 2328 at www.eyesonsuccess.net. We'll also have links to several other previous episodes of Eyes on Success in which we talked about Google accessibility. And I want to remind people that if you think Eyes on Success is useful and helpful to people, as many of our listeners do, and you have a friend who doesn't know about the show, you may share it with them. Tell them they can get Eyes on Success as a podcast wherever they get their podcast, over many radio reading services, or listen on your smart home device by saying, play the Eyes on Success podcast. So let other people know about it. That's it for today's show. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be continuing our conversation with Jotz Nakaki, but focusing on her personal journey, how she got her position at Google, how she's advanced through the ranks to become an accessibility analyst, and all of that despite the fact that when she first applied for the job, the job didn't even exist. We'll talk with her about her journey and how her role has evolved as accessibility has evolved over the years. And she has a very interesting story, so we hope you'll join us for that next week. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.